Thank you. And it's great to be here, and thanks, Wendy, for inviting me, and thanks, Humanity Forums, to uh, the Pan Humanities Forum, in basically sending me around the world. Uh, it was cheaper for me to get a round-the-world ticket to arrive here than any other means, so just to put things in perspective. Uh, and thanks for this introduction. Maybe I should also, not so much qualify it, but add a couple of things. Uh, uh, as you said, I'm an artist, but I'm also the director of Symbiotica, and Symbiotica is a research center uh, at the University of Western Australia where we get people outside of the biological disciplines to come and work with the life sciences and engage in those wet biology art practices, uh, basically uh, be implicated and experientially involved with the manipulation of life forms. Uh, I won't go too much into symbiotica, and I just want to qualify as well that what I'll be talking about today is my own research through the Tissue Culture and Art Project, uh, the work that we uh, researching in, in symbiotica, the projects that were developed there uh, are much, much wider. They are concerning life, but they are concerning life on quite a lot of different levels, uh, from the molecular to the ecology. The level of life that I'll concentrate on uh, in this talk is the level of the tissue and the cells. So it's not the molecular level, it's not genetic engineering. It is a, a very interesting aspect of life, uh, the fragmented body in the level of cells and tissues. And, and I suppose the reason why I was invited here was mainly to do with uh, this piece, uh, the victimless letter piece, or as uh, we titled it, a prototype, a prototype of a stitchless jacket in a techno-scientific body. And I want you to keep in mind the, the idea of the prototype and the idea of the techno-scientific body, uh, because I'll be talking a lot about that. But interesting enough, the work in MoMA resulted in those types of headlines in press around the world, from murder, at Mo murder in MoMA by the Art Asia Pacific to MoMA Kills Art in the New York Times to uh, rest in peace, victimless letter in The Scientist and so forth. And how did we get here? What, what happened that this piece of mouse embryonic stem cells grown into a shape of a small jacket uh, raised such headlines? So for that, we have to go quite back. 1885, William Rauchs was able to demonstrate for the first time that uh, cells can, and tissue can survive outside of the original body from which it was taken. It was... In this case, it survived for a very short period of time, but then uh, there was this realization through the research of Rauchs, as well as uh, the research of uh, Jacques Laub and other scientists, uh, that was uh, articulated quite well and in a way which I find very relevant to our times now by A.G. Wells. So in 1895, he wrote, we overlook only too often the fact that living being, a living being may also be regarded as raw material, as something plastic, something that may be shaped and altered. And he's not talking about wood there. Yeah. That was uh, very shortly before he published uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau. And how many of you here found this statement disturbing in any way or form? Yes? Okay. Each year I present it, there's less and less hands that are coming up, which is interesting as well. Uh, if I would change living being with human being, would you find it more disturbing? Yeah. In the level that I'm working with, there's no difference between human and other life forms. Once you break the body apart, as Rauchs did, you start to realize some really interesting things. So in 1907, uh, Harrison was able to do something further than what Rauchs was doing and actually demonstrate the growth of a nerve cell. It wasn't a multiplying cell, but it was one cell that was able to be isolated from the frog or from the tadpole and grow and demonstrate the growth pattern of a nerve cell. And then in the 1910s, something really important happened. Through the work of this guy over here, Alexis Carell, uh, the whole area of tissue culture was born. So Carell was able to demonstrate and exercise what was later been called uh, tissue culture and cell culture, and basically fragment the body of the complex organism to such a level that the cells that were uh, taken away from that animal were able to survive. Uh, Carell was very much into trying to find the key for immortality, he thought that by isolating those cells, he can make them into immortal cells. He was mistaken, but then later on, as I'll demonstrate and show you, uh, there was a class of cells that are now considered to be immortal. Carell was a very interesting figure, and I'll come back to him later. Uh, so he's to say in this stage that 
he, to some extent, was the inspiration for the Hollywood version of Dr. Frankenstein. And, and also, interesting enough to do it uh, just as a, a sideway kind of uh, discussion, the term artificial life was actually coined back then to refer to this type of work that Carell and Jack Laub and the others were doing, uh, which was then forgotten and reappropriated by uh, the computer community in regard to digital artificial life. Harrison, the guy that did the nerve cell, uh, commented quite early in the stage, and, and that's an indication how, how much the media was into this story of the fragmentation of life. So he said that it seems rather surprising that recent work upon the survival of small pieces of tissue and the growth and differentiation outside of the parent body should have attracted so much attention. Apparently there was much attention directed towards that. But we can read it by the way of the individuality of the organism as a whole, overshadows in our minds the less obvious fact that each one of us may be resolved into a myriad of cellular units with some definite structure and with autonomous power. So suddenly the body is a community. The body breaks down into those individual fragments, those cells and tissues, which have their own individual power. But in order to be able to have this individual power, those cells have to live in a new kind of body. That's the techno-scientific body I referred to before. So one of the assistants of Alexis Carell wrote in 1916 that through the discovery of tissue culture we have, so to speak, created a new type of body in which to grow the cell. And this is the very original tissue culture flasks in which, in which they were growing uh, the cells that uh, Carell was culturing. But there was another type of techno-scientific body that was appearing around the same time, actually somewhat earlier than that. Uh, Anyone's got any idea what's that? Yeah? Maybe that would be even more. <coughs> Those are incubators, humidic cribs for premature babies. The babies live there. The crowd control rails are here. And the, reasons why, the reason why there were crowd control rails was that it was in Coney Island. For about 40 years, this premature baby ward was housed in Coney Island next to the bearded woman and the strongest man in the world. People would pay money to see them, and the reason for that was that the medical establishment didn't want to know about it. It had 80% success rate as opposed to almost zero if those babies would be left alone. When the two French scientists that developed those uh, humidic cribs, uh, Coney and Lyon, were bringing this exhibit to the UK for the Great Exhibition in 1894, the British refused to allow them to use British babies, so they had to import babies from the mainland. And here in the States, 40 years in Coney Island. That's how the techno-scientific operate, body operates, and that's kind of the relationship that we have to that. So it's not surprisingly, obviously, that uh, this type of attention is being given to that. Another thing happened to do with both techno-scientific body as well as another important aspect in the life of Alexis Carrell. In 1938, Carell and Charles Lindbergh, the great American aviator, was from around here, no? Okay. Jersey, okay. Close enough. Uh, <laughs> developed together what's called an organ perfusion pump. So Carell moved from the level of tissues and cells into the levels of organs. He was trying to keep organs alive for long periods of time for eventual transplantation. Uh, I, I suppose also I should state that Carell won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for, in, in 1912. Uh, he was an eminent scientist. And together with uh, Lindbergh, they developed this amazing glass contraption, uh, this organ perfusion pump, which we'll come back to it later, because that was, to some extent, uh, the inspiration for the chamber that we use for the victimless ladder. And it, there was a direct lineage between this pump and what we are using. But also, Carell was publish, published a book in the very same year called Men They Are Known. And in the book, he stated, or suggested, the use of gas chambers to eliminate undesirable elements in human society. Now, the question that I would leave open is, is the fact that Carell was the first, in a sense, to, be, to recognize that the body can be breaked into those indep independent autonomous units with power, uh, made him look at human society in such a way, or because he was looking at human society in such a way, he could come up with this very important conceptual shift of breaking down the body into those living tissues that can be sustained alive in chambers. Let's leave it open because we all know what happened in World War II with gas chambers. 1948, another very important development, the first 
animal saline was developed. Saline are those very, uh, those immortal cells. Um, most cells in our bodies, if you take them outside of the body, they have a finite amount of division the that they go through. It's called the Haflick effect. And uh, it's about 50, so division the to go through before they stop dividing. But there's cells in our bodies that can divide forever, and those are stem cells and cancer cells. So the first mouse cell line, first continuous cell line that was developed back in 1948, is still in operation today. It's still being used for research. I actually worked with those cells. And it's quite an interesting sensation to work with a piece of mouse, which is 60 years old, the oldest living piece of mice in the history of the universe, and it's being used extensively. It's used extensively to such a degree that if we would collect all of the cells that are being uh, around the world now that originated from that one very ill strain mouse cell uh, back in 1948, I can imagine it would fill up this room and even more. The biomass would be much greater. 1951, the very same thing happened with human cells, the HeLa cells, cells that were taken from a cervical cancer of an African-American woman called Henrietta Lacks without her consent or the consent of the family. The HeLa cells, again, are very, uh, basically became those standardized human cell lines for research. And again, they can fill up this room or even more. And I'll come back to the HeLa cells. Uh, there's a very interesting story about that. Many artists actually engage with uh, the whole area of uh, uh, Gila and Henrietta and consent and the use of uh, hair tissue. I won't go too much into that because I want to try to achieve quite a lot tonight, but just keep that in mind. 1954, a very important book was published by White that basically brought this whole area of tissue culture into a standardized field. Before, scientists were really trying to figure out what cells they can grow, what conditions those cells need, what is kind of the optimum techno-scientific body uh, for each case that they are trying to grow. There are a few attempts to use it for, as a research tool, actually in the 1930s when tissue culture was brought to the UK. Uh, that's when they found out that X-ray radiation, for example, is quite dangerous and has a mutagenic, mutagenic properties, and that was by exposing cells to X-ray radiation. But in general, up to the 1950s, Tissue culture was almost like alchemy. It was um, a very, very select group of people were actually were able to exercise it, and it was a very complex operation. Um, White and his colleagues back in the 50s were able to standardize it, simplify the, um, <coughs> the protocols for tissue culture, and allow the use of tissue culture to be used by almost anyone who just wanted, who was able to invest maybe a week of their life to learn the technique. It's not a very complex technique. I managed to do it, so anyone can. Uh, but interesting enough also, what White was writing there in, ref in reference to Carell is a beautiful description and, and a very kind of um, Hollywoodian description, if you like, of Carell's laboratory. Carell, beside being a eugenicist, a Nazi sympathizer, because when the Nazis uh, invaded France in 19... In the 1940s, he joined the Vichy government and set up the Institute of Men. He left the Rockefeller Institute where he was operating and moved there. But also the whole theatrical setup of his laboratories was quite amazing. And again, uh, with my work, I'm referring to it quite a lot. Now there's a big jump to the 1990s, so tissue culture became a scientific tool, a research tool, but also people were starting to wonder what it is. What are those cells that live in this very specialized environment, the laboratory environment, and are they still, for example, part of Henrietta Lacks? So in 1991, uh, Valvelin and uh, Mirona published a paper in the Journal for Evolutionary Theory where they proposed, and they say in all seriousness, I wonder if it is, that the HeLa cells should be considered as a new type of microbe, a new type of life form that might be originated from human but now should be classified as something different. And that the laboratory environment should be considered as yet another ecosystem in which life forms exist. So questioning the whole notion of where those cells come from or how we refer to them and give them some form of agency and independence just by naming them as a new type of life. 1995, again, ushered a very important conceptual shift. How many of you remember the mouse with back? I think 
that this is one of the most, if not the most important image that of the late 19th, uh, of the late, late 20th century. For me as an artist, I was really disturbed when I saw it on um, quite a few different levels. First of all, you know, what I saw was that uh, the Surrealist project came alive. And it came alive through the hands of scientists that had very little understanding of art history and uh, context. It's also expressed an amazing possibility of the, the ability to bring what A.G. Wells was referring to, it's like the plasticity of, the, of life into a fully operational three-dimensional object that is sculpted by human intervention. This mouse with Aaron's back is a product of a technique called tissue engineering. In 1995, uh, Robert Langer and Joseph Vacanti, which is actually was the scientist that I ended up working with in Harvard uh, back in 2000, published a paper where they coined the term tissue engineering and referred to what the possibility of tissue engineering are. And in a sense, that was the birth of regenerative medicine, which is really everything that we hear about now in regard to biomedical research. Stem cells and so forth all came from this humble beginning of this idea of tissue engineering, the idea that we can start to harness the regenerative powers of our own body in order to uh, create body spare parts. Now, the mouse with urine spec, there was nothing genetically engineered about it, and I'll show you, I'll explain the technique shortly of how it was developed. Uh, but the mouse itself acted as a bioreactor, as a techno-scientific body, uh, which in a sense is cheaper to do than the glass vessels of Carell and Lindbergh. So the next couple of slides are actually taken from Joseph Facanti's uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. He was kind enough to uh, allow me to use them. And, and that's how we would use and describe this amazing conceptual shift in regard to our relation to, relation to body that came about through the introduction of regenerative medicine, or at the time it was called tissue engineering. So over here we have an image of how we imagined the body to be repaired back in, 18, in 1989. So you can see that any type of uh, failing or a uh, missing body part would be replaced by some kind of a technological apparatus. That was the time of the great promise of mechanical technology. We'll replace the heart with a pump, we'll replace the hips and the legs with bionic legs, we'll have cochlear implants uh, to uh, assist our hearing, we'll have bionic eyes and so forth. So every part of the body can be replaced in some way or form with a mechanical marvel. Comes 1990s, this is from 1999, suddenly we look the body looks the same, but basically harnessing those uh, regenerative powers of the body to replace body spare parts. Use tissue engineering to engineer everything from hearts to hands to regenerate brains to bones and cartridge. I remember one day sitting in Vacanti's lab in one of the lab meetings, he would draw the image of the human body on the whiteboard and like a Frankensteinian kind of a scene out of a Frankensteinian movie, each research group within the lab would talk about the organ that they are working on and how they're going to put it all together. Back in the 1990s, I was actually a design student. I was researching the idea that maybe through this notion that A.G. Wells was proposing through this uh, application of uh, engineering logic to life, we would need designers to start to work with life forms. So my idea was basically reversing the logic. What happened was that in 1995, shortly after Vacanti and Langa published their book, or published their paper, a, an international consortium of scientists and uh, biomedical researchers and doctors was set up to grow a heart uh, with a deadline of 10 years. So they were promising us that in 2005 we'll have a fully functioning heart grown outside of the body using those tissue engineering techniques. Uh, as a designer's, designer, I said, okay, so if in the 80s we were told that we can replace the heart with a pump, in the 90s we were told we can replace the heart, or basically grow a heart, my question was why not grow pumps using this technique? And that's how I came about this whole idea of semi-living products, semi-living entities uh, that I started to research. And I found it disturbing and challenging and seductive and I decided to continue this project, but not so much as a designer, but more as an artist, because I was more interested in the issues that uh, these concepts raise rather than finding any practical solutions. So let's just go through tissue engineering 101, 101 
a 2000 version, so that's 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago. Things changed quite dramatically since, and mainly because this is not working. So tissue engineering, uh, or as it's known now as regenerative medicine, was set up to create new organs, new body parts. The idea was to create a three-dimensional scaffold out of degradable polymers, so degradable material that you shape in the appropriate shape of the organ you're trying to replace. You then seed it with the appropriate cells. That's from 2000, that's before the stem cell hype, so there were semi-differentiated cells or progenitor cells, cells that can still proliferate but very close to the, uh, the target cells that you're trying to replace the organs with. In vitro tissue culture, so you see those cells onto the three-dimensional scaffold and implement them into the body and you have a new organ. As simple as that. So I wasn't interested in the body. And apparently this technique doesn't really work well for the body. That's why we're back to stem cells. The idea of stem cells is actually quite interesting because what you do is you take those cells and you put them inside the body and the context of the body would make them regenerate the organs rather than try this three-dimensional intervention. But being a product designer or a sculptor that was studying product design and an artist, I was very interested in this type of technique because I found it a very appealing way of creating what, as I said, I was starting to refer to as semi-living sculptures. So as with many technologies, once it's not, they're not very useful for the original purpose that they were developed for, uh, they're becoming reappropriated by other mean, or by other areas. And uh, so tissue engineering now is being used as a research model, a more complex research model than just growing cells on a Petri dish. Uh, they're using three-dimensional tissue engineers, engineered tissue to, uh, as a research model uh, for the whole body. Um, there's some developments in, in developing sensors. Uh, the idea is to grow liver cells and uh, inside tiny bioreactors, inside tiny techno-scientific bodies, and uh, get them out there to identify toxins in the environment, uh, basically like modern canaries. Uh, there's research which is being done into the use of uh, muscle cells as actuators to animate small objects, and that's research that actually I'm, uh, you know, Zuru and myself are really deep into at the moment. We've got some funding to develop that further. And areas of growing food, growing leather, and uh, growing art. It's interesting also, I suppose, to note that uh, as many new technologies, usually the first to pick up on that are the military and the porn industry, uh, we haven't seen any development in the porn industry yet, but there's quite a lot of military research done in this area and also quite a lot of artistic research. In the last count that I had, I think there's at least 40 artists and artist groups that are working with living tissue as an art form now. So in 1996, as far as I know, we were the first artist group to actually do it. We formed, you know, and myself formed the Tissue Culture and Art Project. <coughs> Initially, we grown skin tissue over glass figurines, either found objects like this uh, very cheap glass uh, earring that uh, we found in the Kabbalistic city of Tzfat in Israel and grown skin tissue over it. Or we designed glass figurines to represent different aspects of technology. In this case, um, we designed an object to look like a bomb, but when we finished with it, it looked more like a fertility goddess, which is interesting. Anyway, we didn't really imagine that we would be able to show uh, tissue-engineered sculptures alive in a gallery situation until we were invited to Ars Electronica in, the, in Linz in Austria, which is the biggest art and technology festival in the world and obviously one of the best funded. And they invited us to uh, develop a project that we titled the Tissue Culture and Artificial Womb, or now we know it's more as the semi-living worry dolls. So what we've done there was to use those techniques of tissue engineering, basically degradable polymer, and actually we handcrafted those little dolls using degradable polymer and surgical suture, and then we seeded them with cells and grown them in special microgravity bioreactors uh, throughout the show in this special environment. So the exhibition itself consisted of a fully functioning laboratory with a tiny, the tiny dolls grown inside this bioreactor over there, and we would tend to them. So Every day, we would come into the gallery and feed them between one and two, and it was like feeding time at the zoo. So people would come and watch us doing the very boring uh, procedure of replacing the nutrient solution, uh, so the old nutrient solution with a fresh one, and then set them back into this environment. Now, the reason why we called them worry dolls because, was because they were fashioned after the Guatemalan worry dolls. 
The Guatemalan worry dolls are small dolls that you give to kids before they go to bed. They come in a box of six. Uh, the kids tell the worries to the dolls, put the dolls under the pillow, and the dolls are supposed to take the worries away. Uh, they come in sets of six because kids are only allowed to have six worries. If they have more than that, they're not kids anymore, so we've grown seven worry dolls. Uh, <clears throat> and we had the computer. What we are trying to do, we're trying to elicit response in regard to what we are doing, in regard to the development. That's back in 2000, so you can remember. Actually, that was just before, or actually just after the so-called uh, celebration announcement of, uh, announcement of the uh, so-called completion of the first draft of the Human Genome Project. So there was lots of hype around biotechnology and biology and the possibilities and the scares and promises. And, and, and we were trying to f use that as, as a way in which people would, you know, to tap into people's, into people's anxieties uh, in regard to where we're going uh, with the manipulation of life forms. What we found out is actually that most of the anxieties that people expressed to those dolls were very personal. People actually projected some kind of a, a, almost like a voodoo power to those dolls because they were alive. And um, we ended up, we show this work quite a lot since, uh, we ended up with an amazing database of people's anxieties uh, in the kind of the turn of the century. So from 2000 to actually the last time, it's actually being shown now in Luxembourg, which would be interesting to see what worries the Luxembourgians have. Uh, but the database is on our website, so if there's any social scientist that is interested, it's in seven different languages, I think, but uh, you can try and pick up on that. So, so here also we introduced for the first time with this work kind of a performative aspect, and, and, and what we refer to more and more as the aesthetics of care. The idea of the fact that if we are to manipulate life forms in an artistic context, we also have to exercise some form of responsibility, and, and in a sense, express it through kind of the, the, the performance of, of the duties of care uh, within uh, the, the whole installation. And then the, the following project was uh, the Pig Wings project that Wendy referred to before. Uh, the idea with the Pig, Pig Wings project was actually we were supposed, we were commissioned to produce a celebratory piece for the so-called completion of the first draft of the Human Genome Project. We were more interested in the hyperbole rhetoric that surrounded the Human Genome Project, the madness and of the statements that came out of uh, that at the time, which was actually also a political stunt. The Human Genome Project wasn't even close to completion, but uh, because Celera, the private uh, company, started to uh, take over the public-funded uh, Human Genome Project and the media started to pick up on the, that fact, uh, there was a realization that uh, they have to keep the media quiet and celebrate something so you know the media would have something else to deal with and there was this big ceremony in june 2000, and, uh, 2000 where bill clinton and tony blair and the head of the nih and the head of the welcome trust in the uk all came together to celebrate that and the welcome trust this very organization that was funding part of the public of the public human genome project also had a gallery and they wanted us to submit a proposal uh, for this commission so we proposed the Pig Wings project. The idea was to obviously literally take the, the, the notion of those unfulfilled promises and basically say that, you know, if now you promise us that the impossible is possible because that was one of the statements, eh, pigs could fly. And we wanted to see what shape the wings would take. So, so we were looking at the iconography of wings in Western uh, culture, and it's obvious. Bad, bad wings are attached to devils and demons. Bad wings are attached to angels. And dinosaurs' wings are not really attached to anything because we just found out about them late in our history. So those are the three evolutionary, evolutionary solution for flight invertebrates, which, you know, pigs might pick up. Uh, but each one of them represents something different. So we designed those three sets of wings, and we cultured them inside those special microgravity uh, environments. So I spent quite a lot of time at the Natural History Museum in Harvard and copied the wing structures of those three uh, uh, types of wings and then used a three-dimensional printer to print them, isolated bone marrow stem cells from a pig to, uh, to, grow the wing, to grow them into the shape of the wings. Here you can see the polymer scaffolds, the three-dimensional printouts, and the cells that we are growing uh, for the wings. So here you can see uh, isolating the cells. Uh, one version of the, tissue, of the tissue engineering was to grow layers of uh, tissue and wrap them around those polymers and then grow them in those microgravity uh, conditions. The other version was just to seed the three-dimensional scaffold with them and culture them. And actually, in retrospect, that was the inspiration for the victimless ladder that we'll come to shortly. 
And here you can see seeding. So you create a, a cell soup, you seed it, and here's the polymer over there. Um, <coughs> this is how we presented it in a gallery a year later, but not the Wellcome Trust Gallery. When, when we submitted the proposal, we got one of the most honest rejection letters we ever got, which is nice. We knew that we hit a chord. Uh, beside the fact that uh, we're told that uh, the work doesn't have any artistic or scientific merits, they also mentioned that we didn't reflect the public opinion in regard to the Human Genome Project, which is an interesting thing to ask an artist to do. Um, we sent an apology and said that we, sorry that we didn't reflect what they think the public opinion in regard to the Human Genome Project is owed to be, and we had this interesting change going on, which ended up being on our website as part of the piece, which three years later they found out about it, uh, after they already had a show where they said that they approached artists and expecting some artists would come with controversial uh, suggestions, but to their surprise, none did. So basically hiding the fact that there was a very strong curatorial agenda in regard to the type of works that were supposed to be there, blaming the artists of not being controversial enough and rejecting us uh, ever the same. So they threatened to sue us. There, there was an interesting kind of in-between discussion that was going on about that, including them threatening to pull out any research funding to my university in Australia because they're a big, powerful organization in the United Kingdom, and we're still a very small colony. So we had to remove the website, but I make a point of telling the story because not so much because I want to badmouth the Wellcome Trust. I'm just about to have a show with them, and they just proposed to buy this piece. Uh, but because I think it's interesting to see what the role of an artist is when you start to engage with new knowledge and what agenda the artist is playing with. So in a sense, I wear it as a badge of honor that we're not playing that game in the sense of being able to piss off the Wellcome Trust so much to be threatened by legal action. Anyway, we ended up showing the piece in Australia in a big um, survey show of Australian art uh, in Adelaide in one of the most traditional art galleries in Australia. It's part of the Adelaide International Arts Festival, which was at the time directed by Peter Sellers. And interesting enough, <coughs> when I was talking to Peter before that, I was telling him about the feeding rituals that we've done with the, the, with the worry dolls, and he reflected on the fact that each, each time he goes into a gallery and turns off a video piece, he was actually talking about turning off a Bill Viola piece, he feels as if he's killing the art. And I said... If you want to really kill art, come at the end of this show and join us for a killing ceremony. So that's how we started our killing ceremonies. So by the end of the show, actually by the end of the time that we were there to care for the sculptures, in this case it was about two weeks into the show, we had this amazing announcement in the PA system in this most traditional state gallery of South Australia. The killing of the pig wings is going to take place in 10 minutes. Come down. And people came down, and we pulled out the pig wings out of their sterile environment in which they lived and got the people to touch them and kill them by touch, which was interesting uh, because quite a, of, quite a lot of the people commented that they didn't believe us that the pig wings were really alive, and only by killing them they appreciated the fact that they were alive. Uh, and we, we did like a small ceremony. Uh, I must admit, it was interesting for us because obviously those are bone marrow stem cells from pig grown into wing shapes, but they have no central nervous system or anything like that. But there was a very seldom sense. Uh, Peter Sellers actually was crying uh, during that killing of the pig wings. So that's something that we continue with. Another interesting thing that we've done with the pig wings, so just, I suppose, I'll just show you a couple of things. One of the things came about when we pulled out one of the wings, we got this amazing growth out of it. Another set of wings, if you like, popping out of the bat wings, which was totally unpredicted, and that's something that constantly happens when you work with life. You can't really have full control over the final outcomes. The second thing is we, we had a show in Boston, and we were not there, but uh, Joseph Vacanti came to see the show, the guy that wrote the paper Tissue Engineering, the guy that uh, invited me to our lab, the guy who's responsible for the mouse with ear on spec. And I don't know if by chance or by design, he got photographed with the bat wings popping out of his back. <laughs> and one last thing, the actual original pig wings that we grown at Vacanti's lab for about eight months, we ended up uh, uh, fixing and drying and then coating with gold and keeping in cheap jewelry boxes. 
And when we show the work, we show those pieces uh, next to, when we have the chance to show them alive, we show the live kind of setup with the laboratory uh, and those prints. And we exercise there what we refer to as the aesthetics of disappointment. Because when we show the work, usually the gallery would take the same hyperbole rhetoric that is so common with the life sciences. So people would imagine that if they are, at least, you know, if we want to see flying pigs, at least they would see wings which are big enough for pigs to fly with. And they see those really tiny bits inside those cheap jewelry boxes. And they are disappointed, and I think that that's very appropriate. So here you see, that's actually the killing of the worry dolls, because after killing the pig wings, we decided, okay, we'll start to kill the worry dolls as well. So here you can see some dead worry dolls being killed. So then around the same time, we were developing another project, but I think it was kind of very appropriate in the context of killing because there's another form in which we can engage with life, and that's by consuming it and eating it. Uh, so we developed a piece which we call Disembodied Cuisine, and the idea there was to, to grow a steak using in vitro techniques. So the very same techniques that we used to grow the worry dolls and the pig wings, or the very same technique that was used in order to put the, the ear on the back of the mouse, uh, we developed in order to grow meat, in vitro meat. So here you can see uh, they grow inside those small bioreactors, create those tiny steaks. Actually, that's a recent steak that we grown uh, last year or earlier this year for a BBC documentary. Um, this is the whole setup. So what happened was in 2003, we had, were invited to this big show in France that had enough money to, for us to set up a fully functioning lab in the gallery. Uh, we needed to use totally brand new material, uh, equipment because we were afraid of cross-contamination if any other research was taking place there. And we were able to get new lab equipment, set up the lab, which uh, was a direct reference to Alexis Carell's black lab. Uh, but this lab also had a dining room. And we were playing on this idea of uh, being in France. We were playing on this idea of foul food. Uh, most French people are very... Uh, a verse of engineered food. Most other people find eating frogs quite disgusting. So we decided to grow our tissue engineered steaks, steak, uh, frog steaks. And uh, so, so we also rescued uh, three, two frogs from the edible frog distributor in that town in Ant. They were living in a uh, fish tank uh, in the lab as well as the Xanapus frogs from which we actually got the cells to grow the steaks. And the whole event Basically, for about two and a half months, we would come every day and feed our steaks. And then in the last day of the show, we had this ultimate Nouveau Cuisine dinner where we had eight people uh, joining us eating two very, very small steaks. Each one of them was about the size of a quarter. And we split them together. You can see that's a bit... Um, which <coughs> about four out of the eight spat out the bits of the steak. <laughs> So we collected those bits, and they are now presented as part of the follow-up show, which is called The Remains of Disembodied Cuisine, uh, where we have a video documentation of the piece as well as those bits that were spat out. Now, something to keep in mind, both in regard to uh, this piece and the following one, the uh, victimless letter and the others, I suppose. Straight after the, the show, we got an email from a guy from the University of Maryland uh, and he asked us some questions about uh, the show. So we, it was a really great way for us to debrief and, and develop kind of a, or write down the protocols of, uh, of growing the in vitro meat. And, and we're more than happy to share it with him. So we calculated that it cost us about, in American dollars, it would be around $10,000 a gram of meat. And we needed to use nutrients solution that involves fetal calf serum in order to grow especially fast metabolizing cells like, like uh, muscle cells that we used, uh, you need to use at least 10% fetal calf serum. Fetal calf serum is taken directly from the heart of a calf, which is being pulled out of the uh, uterus of uh, the cow. And so we needed about 500 mils of that, which means if one full calf was used in order to grow those two tiny so-called victimless meat products. Um, this guy, anyway, ended up setting up a company or writing a patent on in vitro meat, setting up a company called New Harvest out of the University of Maryland, and also is now part of a big international consortium of uh, in vitro meat 
uh, uh, producers or researchers, what they failed to mention, or actually they, they claim that we'll be able to find serum-free uh, uh, techniques to grow the meat. They claim that it's going to solve uh, all of the problems of, or well, not all, but a major problem of global warming and basically creating meat that doesn't fart. Uh, <laughs> and that it would be a great solution to our world. I must be a bit cynical about that. But saying that, it, it is important to see because what, what happened also that he published a paper in a fairly significant uh, scientific journal called the International Journal of Tissue Engineering, giving us the credit for being the first to do it, patenting it or nevertheless, but giving us the credit to be the first. And yeah, it's one of the very few instances where artists actually are being credited in such a way. After the <coughs> disembodied cuisine, we, we had a piece called Victimus Letter, which I mentioned before and I'll mention again, but just in regard to that, the, all of those works were part of what we refer to the Victimless Utopia, or in the full name is the Technologically Mediated Victimless Utopia, a very, a very ironic title uh, that was looking at this idea that um, Western technology is getting better and better in hiding the victims of our, consumptions, uh, of our consumption ever so further. And a point in case was that we were starting to collect anecdotal evidence uh, going to Spain quite a lot in the last few years that what we noticed is that as the amount of McDonald's in Spain increased, so did the resistance to bullfighting. So this idea that the very ritualistic, explicit violence of the individual bulls in the bullfighting was replaced by the very explicit but the much, much more grand scale uh, violence of the fast food industry. And we decided to have a one night performance where we're trying to culture cells from a bone of a, a bull that was killed in a bullfight and culture cells from a, a burger and see what the audience would rather kill, which was interesting. Obviously, our audience was quite biased, so they all went to the burger. But um, the, the idea there was really about looking, you know, this whole idea of the in vitro meat, for example, which actually the people for ethical treatment of animals are uh, put, down, put out a price of $1 million for the first one to be able to uh, produce commercially in vitro chicken meat by 2012. Those types of promises of the, the potential of, of creating kind of a guilt-free consumption is something that obviously was manifested, I think, quite well with this idea that as long as we don't really see our victims, we don't really care. So the Victimless Letter was the second one in the series of the Victimless Utopia. The original incarnation of the Victimless Letter was actually when we were invited to present a piece in a textile and fashion show. And what we've done there was to actually hide the fact that uh, it's uh, not so victimless. We, we used a very ironic title of the Victimless Letter. We wanted to see how people would react to that. Uh, our work was shown very, in very close proximity to some traditional leather uh, garments, no one cared about them. Many people came to us and were extremely disturbed by that. Uh, I suppose also to some extent also because we co-cultured mouse and human cells together, which is something which is really easy to do in tissue culture. You can co-culture quite a lot of different organisms. Uh, they don't have immune system, as I said, in the level of cells and tissue. There's no difference between human and animal cells, so they grow quite happily together. And... You can see we've done the very same thing of using this uh, polymer scaffold, which is, comes like felt, cut it into a shape, and then grow the tissue over it using this, this uh, or living in a techno-scientific environment. Um, this is the latest version of the victimless letter. Now we have three of them uh, set up together. Uh, this is the piece that was in Liverpool, in fact, uh, last year, but uh, the very same similar arrangement is currently in Luxembourg as well. I just came back from Luxembourg because I got a phone call uh, saying that uh, I've got fungi growing on my cultures, or on my jackets, which became an even more interesting interspecies uh, relationship now uh, that you know, we had some fungi onto that, so I had to go and replace them, which is another unpredicted version. So with the victimless leather, we basically designed this chamber, as I said, based on the Alexis Carell's and Charles Lindbergh's uh, um, organ perfusion pump, it's actually a modification of a, a perfusion pump that was developed by a scientist in my university where he was growing uh, rabbit ovaries. 
and ovulating them in order to harvest eggs. Uh, so we uh, transformed it into a drip feed system where the jacket, the polymer jacket lives there. It's being constantly fed by uh, dripping nutrients. And it's a closed system, so we don't really need to maintain it. We don't have to come in every day uh, to look after ourselves. Uh, we, don't, we, we have a reservoir of uh, the nutrients. And also, this really epitomizes the idea of the techno-scientific body because we have the, the reservoir of the nutrients, which is like the blood supply. We have the pump in the back there, which is like the heart. And we have the um, gas exchange chamber, which are like the, the lungs. And then the organ here is the jacket. So that's that. We then were invited, uh, as we won the Golden Nika in Ars Electronica in 2007, we were invited again to show our work there. And we decided to produce a piece specifically for that, which would have a reference to both the worry dolls that we've done back in 2000 and some other interesting aspects. Because the, the worry dolls that we've done in 2000, we named them alphabetically, but we dropped the we dropped uh, G because, because of the overhype of uh, genetic engineering at the time. So we said, you know, we don't want to even mention the G word, so we'll drop the G doll. And, and constantly, and, and I'm sorry, Wendy, but our work often is being referred to as genetic engineering, as you just done in your introduction, which is nothing to do with what we're doing. I think there's an overwhelming uh, 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 perception that anything to do with contemporary biology is to do with the molecular level, level and genetic engineering, which I think that it's very driven by an agenda of obstructing life to the level of information in order for us to believe that we have full control over life. Uh, but actually, most of, what's, most of the actualities, especially in the area of regenerative medicine, is happening on the level of the cells and the tissues. So we decided to execute Worried Old G because we were sick and tired of hearing about our work in genetic engineering and we basically set up the system, which was the similar system that we used for the victimless leather, but we decided not to look after it in any way or form, leave it there for the eight weeks of the show, and basically in some stage of the show, somewhere around five or six weeks into the show, the chamber shifted from a life-sustaining techno-scientific body into a death trap. The, the toxic of the waste was accumulating, uh, there was not enough gas exchange, and the whole thing was breaking down. Actually, we hoped that uh, we were hanging our ward all by the neck and we hoped that uh, the head would separate from the body. It was shortly after the execution of one of uh, uh, Saddam Hussein's cronies that I don't know if you know, but uh, their head separated from their body, so I wanted to refer to that as well. And, um, and basically create this death trap and, and, and change the whole idea and the whole perception of that into this irreversible performance, uh, performative execution without being able to put a finger on when exactly the doll died. And then I suppose that's the one, the project before last that I would refer to. As you've seen, we, we were trying to shy away to some extent from the human body. And one of the reasons for doing so was that we were not interested in the kind of the biomedical discourse as much as the idea of the semi-living but also because we're trying to figure out if there's any way we can refer to those fragments of life that are being sustained in those artificial environments in a new way. And we knew, and to some extent we predicted, that if we are to engage with the human form, people would fall into kind of the path of less resistance and the discourse would be less interesting for us. But we couldn't resist when Selak approached us. Selak is an Australian performance artist that since 1997 was hoping and proposing to be able to grow or at least uh, implant an ear initially on the side of his head and later on on his left arm. Uh, Solar work is a lot to do with um, the fact that the human body is obsolete in the light of technology, but also he's very interested in the notion of the prosthetic as, as a form of excess rather than a form of uh, lack. And Selak was one of the artists that, uh, to, to a large extent, influenced my own practice. So when he approached us with this idea of collaborating, we decided to go ahead and develop this piece, which we called the Extra Year Quarter Scale. And what we've done there was to take a, a cast of Stellak's left ear, uh, miniaturize it using uh, digital means, and then uh, use the very same system that we use to grow our other sculptures and grow is miniaturized left ear in 
uh, this techno scientific body. We, we never had the intention of reintroducing it into Stellar's body. He had the proposition, but what we decided to do that this would be a collaborative project with two very, uh, to some extent, opposing narratives meeting with this one object. Uh, and it kind of worked to some extent. Although the, the first time we presented uh, this work was actually in a converted church in Ljubljana in Slovenia, uh, which generated another layer of uh, uh, interest within the, this whole piece because when we were invited to show it again in the National Gallery of Victoria in Australia, the, one of the very first things that the, the curators, because we were invited, uh, we were, uh, this piece was uh, up for a prize that was selected by ex an external jury and then when uh, the oh, gallery found out about that, my computer just died. Wonder. Um, I think I ran out of juice. Apparently, the Australian-American connection doesn't seem to like each other. Okay, I'll continue, but I wonder if I can get some assistance there with some power. Thanks. Um, so when the gallery found out that this work was selected, uh, they apparently had uh, some bad history with some religious right activists in uh, Melbourne when they were showing the peace price of uh, Sereno. Uh, and they were afraid that the very same people would come and try and jeopardize and harm this piece. So they, they were basically... Hmm? Okay. Um, so, so they basically were, uh, for the first time really in our work, was evoking this idea of uh, uh, blasphemy, which is interesting. You know, no one was evoking the idea of blasphemy when we were growing pig tissue into shapes of wings, uh, but when we decided to grow human ear using human tissue, suddenly the image of God was evoked. And I must admit that if anyone thinks that Stellak is the image of God, there's an issue there. Uh, cool. Thanks. So, so it was an interesting exchange that we had with them. Uh, first of all, they wanted us to uh, obtain an ethics approval to our work, which is something we constantly do. We work within a university. We run, I run a research institute. I need to get all of the right clearances from the right authorities each time I produce a new project. Uh, but in this case, it was interesting because we don't really need an ethics approval if we're using cell lines like the HeLa cells that I showed you before because there's no donor that we can get consent from and those cells are commercially available through tissue banks. Um, and the initial idea was to use a, a cell line for this piece anyway because there was no interest in kind of implanting it back into the body. Thanks. Uh, so, put it back there. Yeah. Um, so when I wrote the ethics application, I actually wrote it in such a way where the audience were my subject and I had to uh, basically put my ethics committee in a position where they had to decide if they were going to act as a censorship board or just leave us alone, which they left us alone. And, and actually after that I was invited to give some lectures to some of the law, uh, in the law faculty because some of the lawyers were sitting there found it a very interesting proposition. Um, and then they decided that the religious right would still be annoyed with us. They wanted a letter from me saying that, my work, that our work doesn't generate any ethical issues. And I said, and I'm sorry, but I said, what the fuck? You know, <laughs> how can you? And, and then basically they said, okay, so we'll allow you to show the piece. There was more complications. We decided to do a Salon de Refugee across the road. They realized they're going to be damaged even more. So they said, we allow you to show the piece as long as you're not going to use human cells to grow into the shape of a human ear which I, again, found, you know, it might be even, even more blasphemous. Um, so we said, okay, you know, it, from our perspective, it actually works really well with our discourse. It's actually generated this idea of kind of continuing, you know, that uh, life is the same in that level. It doesn't really matter if it's human or animal. And then the day of the opening, they came to us and said, can you just, in the label for the piece, can you just mention that just that they're not, non-human cells and don't mention that there are animal cells because now we're afraid of the animal welfare people <laughs> coming and attacking us. So we did it. Then we did a one-night performance with Stellak where we actually were telling the story 
in this amazing Frankensteinian old powerhouse in the old uh, railway yards in Perth. And it was a one-night performance. We actually grown the year for about four weeks before in our laboratories. And then uh, we had the lecture performance, both Stelak, United, or the three of us, Stelak, United, and ourselves, were kind of talking about the piece in different ways. And then we invited the audience to come and kill the year. So the whole performance was a one-night kind of killing performance. Uh, we had about 50 people in the audience, and it was really interesting to view uh, the ways in which people were trying to kill the year. And, you know, how do you kill an year? <laughs> okay, I'll skip this piece. This is our latest piece, which is to do with a totally different story to do with uh, the, the return of the cabinets of oddities, but I won't have time. And I'll just finish with this one because that's another really interesting uh, encounter that we had with Wired magazine. They approached us and they wanted an image for one of their publications. And initially they said, we want our logo grown out of tissue. And I said, there's no way we're going to do it. It's disrespectful to the tissue and it's also problematic and we're not in the business of growing logos. But we have uh, some images of the worry dolls we never shown before and we'll be able to, you know, we'll be happy to give you the, the first rights to, to uh, publish them. And they came back and said, yes, as long as the worry dolls are going to wear the wired t-shirt. <laughs> so I, I got really annoyed with them and just as a way to get them off my back, I said, the only thing which your logo that I'm willing to grow is a zit. I'm referring to the readership. And they said, cool, go for it. So I was already committed to do it, so I ended up growing the semi-living wired zit. Uh, <laughs> which was published in Wired back in, I don't know when. Yes. Thank you.